Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. I don't know, I've had some thoughts that have just kind of come to me a number of times recently, and as always, I sort of wrestle, is this you, is it you for now? You always have those kinds of questions, and it's good that we do question, because we don't want to just, you know, we don't want to just get in the habit or form. Uh, we need what the Lord has. But I've had some thoughts on a, certainly a, a common subject in the scriptures, and that's faith. Because I think it's something that needs a little deeper understanding. I'm always concerned. I know the Lord is concerned about people that grow up in our midst or that people who are just exposed to religion in general, um, you know, they profess a kind of faith. And the real question is, what is real saving faith? Because there is a kind of a faith that goes so far and, you know, believes, believes many things, believes many good things, even experience things from the kingdom. But they stop short. And uh, Hebrews 11 is where I probably will, will largely go. But, uh, you know, the writer, as we've said many times, the writer to the Hebrews was writing to Jews who had grown up knowing the law of Moses. They were, in their minds, keeping the law of Moses and making the sacrifices. That was the way to be right with God. And they were glad to hear about Jesus and, and certainly understood in a measure from what he's saying in this book 
the author is, uh, is recognizing that there are among them a people who have real faith, but he's recognizing the others that concern him. And uh, he warns over and over again of, in, in different ways about going so far and stopping short. And he uses the example of the Israelites and how many of them went out from Egypt, and it's pretty evident that they had a certain amount of faith. They, they walked, I mean, you know, God kind of put them in a box, but still, uh, they followed Moses, they went across the Red Sea, they, they said, Lord, speak to us and, and tell us what to do at, the, uh, at Mount Sinai. They listened to the law, they went along for a long time. But many of them did not have enough to carry them through. They had a kind of a faith that really wasn't what was needed. A certain few did, Caleb and Joshua among them, and uh, they were preserved, whereas another, as a whole generation perished in the wilderness. Faith becomes, in the scripture, faith is really the, uh, the coin of the realm, is one way to put it. Uh, and you, you get a picture uh, in the verse that is so often quoted in verse, verse 6 of chapter 11, where it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So, I mean, obviously, no matter what else someone does or thinks that they are doing with respect to God, there's nothing other than faith that will please him. You can work until you're blue in the face. You can keep his laws to the best of your ability. You can uh, devote your life to good works and helping little old ladies across the street. And it will, ne you know, it won't earn you one, th one thing when it comes to the, uh, the what's, uh, you know, what's eternal. So th this is an impossibility. But you know, I thought of another scripture, and I, I haven't even taken time to look this up, but it's in Romans chapter 8 that I think helps to illustrate a point that I want to make uh, in, in unlocking this subject. I'll, I'll just refer to it. But anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a scripture there that says, in effect, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, in the flesh simply means operating in the strength of human nature. It's just another way of saying that. In other words, you, all, you and I were born with certain kinds of abilities. We can think, we can feel, we can choose. But our abilities are, as we know from the scriptures and as we know from experience, if we're honest, our, everything about us is hijacked by a wicked principle called sin. It, it, it absolutely undermines every possible thing that we might do that would somehow, we might think, commend us to God. It becomes, it's an absolute impossibility. And I guess the, the central point that I'm, I'm trying to get to is this, that, that faith, what, what the Bible really calls faith, is something that is completely impossible for a human being. You can scratch as deep as you want into human nature and you will never find faith. You can look at the most religious, the most zealous person on the planet, and if you're talking about somebody who is doing what they're doing in the strength of, their, of what they were born with, then it's not faith. I don't care what it is. And obviously, we know people are different. Some people are very strong-willed, others are very weak-willed. But that's not the point. What God calls faith is absolutely supernatural. And folks, if we don't have it, we don't have what we need. Now, there's something interesting in verse 1. Faith, uh, in the NIV it says, Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And there's a, a little deeper sense in, in the, the, the language behind that than simply uh, a kind of, well, I'm deciding to believe in God. See, that's what a lot of people call faith. They think of faith as sort of a leap in the dark, a, a blind, okay, I'm, you know, this sounds, sounds good to me, uh, all this God stuff. I see people who seem to believe it and they're happy, so I'm just going to believe it. And they call that faith. And all it is is just a, simply a human decision. And that's not what faith is. There's, there's something very, very tangible, very supernatural about faith. You know, in the, in the King James, it says faith is the substance 
of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There is, there is something, that sounds crazy when you think about it. What evidence, what evidence do I have that God exists? I mean, you could say, yeah, look at the universe, but I'm talking about really what, in here, what evidence do I have that there is a God, that his word is true and all of that? What evidence do I have? Yeah. See, I, it's not something I can muster up. It's not just a, some decision where somebody gives me the reasonableness of faith. This is something that God has to do. God has to give me something supernatural. And when he implants that into my heart, then there is something in there. There is a little piece of God, is one way to put it. There is a measure of his spirit that enters into my being, and now I have something on the inside that is evidence of the reality of God, the reality of his kingdom, and somebody who does not have that on the inside is, I don't get it. They're clueless as to what in the world this is all about, what's going on. Folks, we can have kids grow up in our churches and, and they don't get it. And we've had testimony after testimony of people who have, you know, grown up, gone out, come back. And, and their testimony is, I didn't get it. I didn't understand. I didn't know what it was all about. And there's a reason for that, folks. We have got to have what this is talking about and it can only come from God. It is the faith itself, this capacity for me to surrender and to put my trust in him is an ability that only God can give me. I don't have it. See, what happened to the human race is when we decided to go our own way, we became relentlessly rebellious and independent and self-willed and very much tied in with that is a spirit that is, that is unable to trust, unable to really put my trust in God and his love and his purpose. I'm always, there's always going to be that sense of reserve. I'm always going to have, if I have anything at all towards God, there's going to be that sense of I'm, I'm holding something back. I'm, 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 I'm trying him out. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's called faith out there where people are trying out Jesus. I'm going to go to church for a while. I'm going to hang out with the people. I'm going to lift my hands when they do. I'm going to pray. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to try out this Jesus business and see how it works. Oh, God, that's, that has nothing to do with anything. I, I, I understand that when someone is being drawn, someone, God is dealing with somebody, there is a time period. You know, there's a time period, uh, you know, for human conception. You don't, you don't have a baby overnight. It, there's a process that goes through. And there is with, with coming to the Lord. But I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about. You're, I'm talking about something that is simply, simply happens in the natural realm. And it's people reacting in some way to God and to the things of God. And, and all they really have is something that they have Somehow, for some reason, with some motivation, they have decided, I'm going to follow Jesus. But if it's not what we're talking about tonight, if it isn't God putting that spark in here, I mean really begetting a piece of himself in here, where we're born of his spirit, there's something real in here, we don't have anything to stand on. And I'll tell you, sooner or later, sooner or later, what you're calling faith, God's going to see to it that what your real motivation is, what that reserve thing is, God's going to put it right beside you and make you make a choice. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I believe with all my heart that God brings people to those kinds of crossroads in their life where they have to make a choice. Am I going to go all the way with Jesus or am I going to draw back because I've tried him and it didn't work out like I expected it? Is this the truth? Yeah. Oh, how we love to put conditions and imagine how it's going to be. But I'll tell you, if you're doing that, you are basically staying on the throne of your own heart. You're believing in yourself, not him. You're trying to use him to satisfy some part of self 
When, you know, real salvation is from self. It's from me. I need saving from me. Oh, I'll tell you, only God can, can so work in a heart where I can reach that kind of a conviction about my own need to where I know the only thing I can do is throw up my hands. The only hope that I have is that God will be merciful to me because there's not one thing I can offer him except my brokenness and my helplessness. It takes a miracle of God to produce that kind of a conviction in somebody's heart. And I pray, I pray, and, and believers pray that God will do this because it isn't a matter. I'm, I'm so conscious of this, even as I, as I try to minister, I'm, I'm so conscious that it's not just a, a, a matter of explaining it right. God has got to confront the heart. Oh, how we need him. I mean, someone could stand up here in brogans and broken English, and if God's spirit was in it, it would do more than, a, than a, an oration. We need God to come and confront. There's got to be an encounter. There's got to be an encounter that touches that deep thing in you that is the real motivation for your life and mine. Oh, how lovingly, how patiently he does it. But oh, I'll tell you, the people that he describes in chapter 11, you want to see what real faith looks like? You look at their lives, and you'll see some of the characteristics of people who have met God, and they've met him in such a way that it, it's, it's no longer about the issues. See, the Israelites could go along with God up about this issue. And then they come to another one, and they wrestle with it. Okay, I'll go along with you on this. I'll go along with you on this. But God knew that down deep in their hearts, they didn't believe him. See, it isn't a matter of evaluating issues. Because if that's how you're serving God, you're still on the throne. You're calling the shots. You're deciding what's right and, what's right and what's wrong. Oh, I'll tell you, you look at somebody like Abraham. He is listed, he's given to us as the father of faith. God birthed something in his heart that was real. It carried him through all of his days, through all kinds of trials, and the biggest trial was waiting. I guarantee you nothing worked out the way Abraham expected it to. But there was something. And God alone knows I mean, I'll, I'm not going to try to get into the sovereignty and the human will and all that kind of stuff. All I know is God went to this idol-worshiping man in the middle of an idol-worshiping culture and met him in such a way that Abraham put his faith in that God and his promise. And that faith, that, that something that entered into his spirit Oh, it enabled him to believe and to stand in times every possible way that faith was tried. Every possible way, waiting 25 years until he, until he had, uh, uh, until everything was po impossible. You know, God is going to show us that this is a matter of, of something that only he can do. How many of you have been in impossible situations or you sensed total impossibility in you? And you've been led to just cry out and say, oh, God, I just, I'm, I'm, I can't fix this, but you can. I'm trusting you. <laughs> That's what he wants. <laughs> God, we make it so hard on ourselves. We struggle and strive and try and try, and God's just waiting for us to give up and say, Lord, <laughs> you're the Savior. I'm just trusting in you. I'm resting in you today instead of I'm striving, trying to be a Christian. Oh, I'll tell you what. But that, that, that thing that he puts births in us, it's, it's amazing and it's real. But it carried Abraham through all the issues of his life. He had, to, he had a son by, uh, by a handmaid. It was part of the culture of the day. It was a way to have an heir. And, uh, you know, God blessed in, in a way. God, there were promises that were given, but that's not the heir. God had to tell him, and oh, Abraham had to, had to be willing to let that son go. 
Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. You sense the yearning and the love and the, you know, the, the quality of a heart that he had. It was real. But yet he had, to, he had to say, God, I don't understand, but I know you do. I know you love me. I trust you. There's no question as to what I'm going to do. I may, I may have to really look to you for strength to do it, but there's no question here. I'm not sitting here deciding issue by issue whether I'm going to obey you or not. I believe you. My confidence is so firmly fixed in your person because you put a measure of your own spirit in me that connects me to you. It gives, it imparts to me an ability I don't have in myself. Oh God, we, we've got to have that, folks. We got churches full, all over the place in America. Thank God there's a remnant that, that have what we're talking about. But there's so many that have what they call faith, and it's not the faith that, we, that he's talking about in this book. You know, how does God do that, by the way? How does God give, by, give faith? By his word, doesn't he? We all know the scripture. He, Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, but what, what is the quality of the, what, what is it about the word of God that makes it different from some man who just comes up and, and just spouts out great ideas? It's God's spirit. It's not just ideas. You remember how Jesus said the words that I speak unto you are what? Spirit and life. Yes, there were sounds involved. Yes, there were ideas involved. Yes, there was a physical process involved. But what they conveyed was a measure of his spirit and his life. And it made all the difference in the world what happened on the receiving end, didn't it? You remember how Jesus talked about the, the sower? He likened the word to a seed that a farmer went out and sowed, and he sowed it in different kinds of ground, didn't he? And those different kinds of ground represented different kinds of people. And one of them was so hardened, so trampled down that the seed couldn't penetrate at all, it sat there on the surface and the birds came and took it away. You know, we look around the scriptures, we can see, we get a picture of what he's talking about there. What's that talking about? That's devils. I'll tell you, demons are real. And I'll tell you, if, where, the, where the word of God does not penetrate, in the first place, the condition that causes it not to penetrate is a fruit of the devil at work to harden the heart, to, to work with human nature and to minister his spirit to such a degree that that heart is utterly resistant to the word of God. Oh, what a horrible place to be. You know, that's where the world's going. Strong delusion is where there is a conviction of something that it, this, a conviction that something is true and it is absolutely a damnable lie from hell designed to destroy. But all the, the word of God goes out and it lands sometimes on that kind of a heart, but it doesn't do any good, does it? But there's another kind of soil where all oh, the results were immediate. Have you ever seen that? Where you see, the, you see somebody just lap up the word. Oh, that sounds great. That's awesome. That's wonderful. I believe it. I'm rejoicing in it. I'm, and it just seems to, something seems to pop right up as a result of the influence of that word on their heart. And what's the problem? Down deep, there are those stones, rocks. There's no soil there. What's down underneath is hardened. It's resistant. It just, it, it's like something else has just got control of the, of the inner life. God, if we're saved, we're going to have to give him all of our lives, the inner part and the outer part, the part that nobody even knows about. Yes. God has the power to heal the deepest places in the life, but he's going to have them. We have got to have a conviction that we can give him those places and trust him to do what is needful in our lives. But here's a case where somebody has got these reserves in their life. They just, 
these things that, yeah, I want this, I want that. They want cafeteria religion is what they want. They want to be able to pick and choose the good parts, the, the tasty parts, but they don't want the part that causes them to say, I'm giving up my life. I'm willing to die. I'm willing to suffer and die for you, Lord, if that's what, if that's what it takes. This is worth everything to serve you. They don't get that part. And so when something comes along that touches one of those areas, that's it. I'm out of here. See, these are among the people who try Jesus. And the third category was, was people who, they started and they ran for a while, but there were other things that, that came in, that there were the interests of this world. They, they were more interested in the things of the world and the things of their life. And, and all of that began to crowd in, began to choke out the word. It became non-effective in their hearts and their lives. And what is that? You still see self on the throne, don't you? You see, what, you see the root of that? It's, yeah, I want Jesus and I want to have this, but I also want this. And I'm not really willing to, to go one way or the other. I want, a, I want a mixture. And so the real interests of the heart begin to rise to the surface and that they take over and they take them down the wrong road. Next thing you know, they're way out in left field. I'll tell you, don't you, think, don't you know there were people in Noah's day who had heard the word of God and somehow they had just gone down roads like this? And all of a sudden the rain began to fall. And it was too late. See, these are eternal issues. God's not just blowing smoke. This is a real, this is a, th these are eternal issues as to whether people hear the word of God in such a way that it begets real faith in the heart. Oh, I'll tell you, I've, if, if you're at all uncertain tonight, you better be crying out to God. If, if what I'm saying disturbs you, you better be glad that it disturbs you, but you better say, oh, God, help me is right. Oh, God, open my understanding. Lord, I, I don't quite get the. I want to get it, Lord. I want you. I know that I cannot save myself. I know that I need you. But I cannot do what I need to do. I just, Lord, bring me to that place. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. While it is not required, a donation of $10 for DVDs and $5 for CDs is suggested to help with expenses. Also, for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your requests to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.